uh, on the line now from the United States, my dear colleague and friend, Rachel Blevins. Welcome back, Rachel. We miss you when you're not here. I promise you that. Let's deal with that point first. There's no sign that hanging people, gassing people, shooting people, and electrocuting people in the electric chair, A, does anything to deter murders in the United States, and B, if we were to start talking now about the number of innocent people that have been fried, uh, it wouldn't stand up to much examination, this case uh, that's being made for the return of the death penalty, would it? Oh, absolutely. I agree. And I know here in the United States, especially in a state like Texas, where I'm from, the death penalty is quite common. And in a case where you're looking at a brutal murder, it is for many people easy to make that argument that they should go for the death penalty. But then when you actually look at just how often they get it wrong and it is insane to think about them getting it wrong even once, let alone how often they do get it wrong and how many wrongfully convicted people not only spend decades in prison here in the United States, because we do have the largest prison population in the world, of course, us talking about how we're such a wonderfully free country, but that is something that the U.S. has built up to. But in addition to that, they also have a number of wrongful convictions and a number of people who are killed, and then they find out later down the line that either they were not the one who committed that murder or that there was someone else that they should have been going after. And so I agree in that sense of you look at a case like this, but at the end of the day, you know, you have to remember, like you said, it is the state that's carrying it out. And it's shameful how often the state not only gets it wrong, but then faces no consequences for getting it wrong. Now, Joe Biden this week uh, made one of his, uh, his supersonic flights uh, at the uh, dispatch box. I don't know which box he was at, but I saw clips uh, of his uh, video in which he appeared to lift off over the subject of democracy. He said there were fewer democracies uh, than there had been 20 years before. He didn't make the case for how wonderful democracy is uh, because that would be difficult. Uh, he didn't explain why the United States has put so much effort into destroying other people's democracies and killing their leaders, by the way. Uh, the, uh, the president of, uh, of the Congo, Patrice Lumumba, the president of Chile, Salvador Allende, uh, the mm -hmm. attempts to kill uh, the president of Venezuela, uh, the uh, Nicolas Maduro, and so on. He didn't explain any of that. Um, but wouldn't the American people not be better off attending to what is happening in their own country than endlessly talking about other people's political system? You know, you said he didn't explain that. I'm not sure that he could explain that, George. I mean, you look at Joe Biden and he struggles to answer the most basic questions, let alone why U.S. foreign policy is the way that it is. But I would agree. Absolutely. I mean, you look at what the United States has done, especially over the last two decades, especially when you look at the Middle East and you ask yourself, what has come out of it? I mean, is the United States better off? Because not only is it invading countries, bombing countries, overthrowing leaders, and killing innocent people, countless innocent people along the way. But in addition to that, it's also spending a hefty amount of money to do that, money that would be better spent here in this country, taking care of the people here. And it really makes you wonder why this is something that has continued. You know, it's not a Republican or a Democrat thing. It's something that has continued on both sides of the aisle. It's something that, you know, Joe Biden has invested heavily in as he claims he spent 150 years in Congress or something uh, around there. We're but, not you know, making this up. The he really did say that. <laughs> Yes, according to him, he's been there for much longer than the rest of us, that's for sure. But, you know, it seems to be one of those things where even the presidential candidates that go in there and say, you know, you look at someone like Trump that sits there and says, we need to end the endless wars. And then all of a sudden you have his administration convincing him trying to overthrow Nicolas Maduro in Venezuela. I mean, it really makes you wonder, are they not getting it? Or is there just more to the story in terms of this political machine that they become a part of? And it was interesting this week to see that uh, Secretary of State Tony Blinken made a comment in which he was referring to Iran and he said, all options are on the table, including military action. 
And that reminded me of a phrase that was used by Mike Pompeo so often. And we're supposed to think that these two guys are on absolute opposite sides of the aisle, yet they're sitting there saying, all options are on the table. Military action possibly is on the table that the United States is willing to start another war that it does not need. And it just comes back at the end of the day to how is this better for the American people? And I would argue that it's not. Well, absolutely, uh, it's not. Uh, I watched a fascinating interview by our colleague, Afsan Ratansi, with uh, former Secretary, uh, Secretary uh, Bolton, John Bolton. Now, it was an act of madness, uh, Trump appointing him uh, yeah. to these uh, high positions. Uh, but it was very, very clear that Bolton's attack on Trump was because Trump was not crazy for war enough. Yeah. Oh, yes. And that's what's so interesting is you get someone like, and I know that that's kind of been a criticism that has come up back again, which is to say, look, if Trump runs for president again, if he wins, we really need to talk about his cabinet picks because there were so many things he campaigned on. And then when it came to choosing his cabinet, it was the opposite. He chose people that believed the opposite of what he claimed that he believed. And then you have someone like Biden who comes in and everyone was just standing there and cheerleading for his cabinet picks because they talked about how diverse they were because they were looking at their gender or looking at the color of their skin and not at all looking at the fact that the one thing that both Trump and Biden have in common is that they are picking these establishment picks who will continue to carry out the exact same foreign policy and even in many cases the same domestic policies that have been going on for decades now and that never really change anything even though we all want to talk about how different the president is from the last one. What about the former first family? They've been in the news uh, this week. Bill is in hospital, uh, uh, apparently with poisoned blood, who'd have thunk it? Uh, and we saw Hillary uh, hurrying in and out of the hospital. I hope they were careful to uh, keep her away from the, uh, the switches and the, uh, the lifelines. Um, she, <laughs> on the other hand, has now become uh, an author, a crime author, is it? A novel. Yeah, you know, the Clintons just can't seem to stay out of the news, I guess. And it was interesting with Bill Clinton. They immediately said it's not COVID-19. I guess he had some sort of urological infection. They say that he was released from the hospital just a couple of hours ago. So it sounds like he's doing OK. But yeah, meanwhile, Hillary is over here becoming some sort of crime thriller novel author. Now, they're calling this fiction. But the book itself, it sounds like, is about a secretary of state who was appointed by her former rival, which is something that Hillary Clinton knows a lot about. So yes, they're referring to it as fiction, but it is interesting to see this new book that she apparently co-authored is all about terrorist attacks and you know what you would do as a secretary of state and that sort of position. And it's a reminder that this is what we do with former politicians. This is what we do with U.S. war criminals like Hillary Clinton, like George W. Bush. The media loves to sort of rehabilitate them and make it look like they're all warm and cozy, like your older grandparents. And with Hillary Clinton, they're like, look at her. She can write a book. Well, there's not much talk about all that she did, specifically while she was Secretary of State alone, all of the crimes that she committed, you know, when we're talking about Libya, when we're talking about her wanting to go further after Syria, everything that she did while she was with the Obama administration. I mean, I would love the nonfiction version of that where she's actually honest <laughs> about good. all of the roles that she played in that administration and all of the people that died as a result of it. Yeah, that would be crime nonfiction, uh, a different <laughs> category uh, altogether. Just as an aside, is a, a novel by Hillary Clinton likely to sell well? You know, I think that it would with a certain, you know, a certain population of people. It's likely to make the New York Times bestseller list just because that's much more about who you know, who's publishing you, that sort of thing. And, you know, she may be more uh, popular at that, so to speak, than she would be a num at a number of other things. The question this then becomes then, is she going to try to get back into politics, which hopefully the answer there is no, because I think she's tried her hand at that a few times and gotten the exact same results every single time. But you never know. I, I don't know what it is with the Clintons and why they feel the need to get back into the spotlight. You would think that people like them, with the kind of money they have, that they would sell off into the sunset, go live on an island and retire happily there. But 
Instead, they're here giving us photo shoots from hospitals and crime novels. The, the devil never sleeps, uh, <laughs> let me assure you. Uh, finally, talking of people coming back into politics, because we know nothing about what Donald Trump does nowadays, because he's banned uh, from all the uh, public spaces, as they used to be called, the public squares. Um, what's the latest on Trump? What's he been up to this week? You know, he's still having a number of rallies this week. He's actually going to be deposed. He's going to testify before court virtually, rather, on a case of it sounds like that there's a few protesters. They claim that they were roughed up by Trump's security team outside of the Trump Tower back in 2015. Now, you may wonder, why are we talking about this case? It sounds like it's just now coming back around six years later. And there are a number of kind of lawsuits that Trump is facing. And so I think that we're much more likely to see more of that and to maybe see more testimony from as we go along. But we still have not gotten an announcement on whether or not he's going to run. I'm still waiting to see what he's going to do, how he's going to do it. And of course, then it all comes down to if he decides he's running, which running mate is he going to pick this time? Because I highly doubt it's going to be Mike Pence. Uh, totally. Uh, it's impossible that it should be him. <laughs> I, I think a, a, a good, I know you're not a gambling woman, but if you were, uh, the the uh, the governor of Florida would be the man to put your money on, don't you think? See, I would think that he would be, but he may actually try to take Trump on. I think that he's built up a lot of favor in terms of his response to the pandemic over the last year. You know, there's been a lot of frustration with a number of governors, such as the one that we've seen in the New York City and the way that they handled it. And Florida has kind of been one of those states, especially for Republicans who, you know, those who felt like they didn't get the fair outcome of the 2020 election. And now they're watching the way that the U.S. government has handled the pandemic, the lockdowns that they have put out there, and they don't trust the way that it was handled. Sure, they're going to go after someone like DeSantis, and he is going to be their guy. But of course, if if Trump is the one who overtakes him, then I could see him maybe signing on for a vice presidential role in the hopes that that'll, you know, advance his career later on down the road. Yeah, I mean, uh, just as we've said about Joe Biden, uh, a second Donald Trump administration won't feature Donald Trump at the head of it for a whole term unless he's Superman. But if he was Superman, he'd now be kissing guys. Uh, who would have thunk that either? <laughs> Rachel Blevins, thanks for joining us on the Mother Thank of All you. Talk Shows.